Hello, nerds of the internet. Welcome to episode whatever of the Basement Lab podcast. I'm Zach. And I'm Russ. I'm Seabass. Jordan. Still raised my hand. <laughs> and we will be discussing uh, Gotham by Gaslight, the graphic novel, not the movie, although we may do the movie in the future. Um, so I, we'll just jump in at the beginning with everybody's general impressions of the comic. Russ, you want to start us off? <laughs> it was a solid, fun time. I was n- I had not read it before, and so I think probably if I had read it closer to the time period it came out, I probably would have enjoyed it more, but I did really enjoy it. Which I believe was... 89. Okay, I was going to say, say. Early, early 90s at a time, right? Um, really? Wow, that changes my opinions a lot more in a positive way. So it, re- yeah. it recently was published as a paperback trade, well, again, uh, or reprinted, I guess, as a paperback trade, so that uh, it could accompany the release of the animated movie. Um, but it came out in 1989, like apparently. Thank you, Russ. And my initial first impressions is that it's a great premise. I like I like Batman, so I like the idea of a Batman story set in the 1800s. I think it's a creative way of storytelling. Uh, I thought there were some things that it could have done better, but we'll get into that when we get into specifics. Uh, yeah, I have to agree with both of you. I definitely like the whole new twist, <clears throat> I say, on Batman with Jack the Ripper and it being held in the late 1800s. 1888. 1888, yep. So. It was definitely nice seeing Batman in a new light, so to speak. Uh, it definitely does kind of go in between being just comic history and a little bit of steampunk, which is going to be present in almost any Batman comic as it does have steampunk influences, uh, the modern tellings of Batmans anyway. Um, I really enjoyed it. I. Um, it is interesting because it is two parts and it's two different stories put together um and i kind of wish they had continued on with the gotham by gaslight storylines and just have batman set in this you know late 1800 early 1900 slightly steampunk but definitely victorian age america and just exploring it that way um i definitely wish they had gone further although you can see with the second part why they stopped um, because you definitely need the right illustrator and the right author. <laughs> would you would you call it steampunk? Because I felt like it was more turn of the Industrial Revolution era. Uh, so it had very minor steampunk issues, which can just be, you know, alternate history. Like it doesn't have to be overtly something completely different uh, than what we would expect. And again, it's a comic book, so you could just be like, oh, it's comic book history, not steampunk. And I would not argue that. I'd be like, sure, works for me. Yeah, I don't think it's necessarily, again, especially being written what it was, that it's necessarily intended to be overtly steampunk. No, no, I agree with that. I don't have a problem classifying it as that, although that wouldn't be the first thing I would I would would say say. very, very light levels. You can see the, you can, you can definitely see where steampunk had already been invented by, by this point in time and some ideas of it. And like I said, it definitely fits in with Batman storytelling from the 80s on, typically has steampunk influences. Sure. So let's talk about specifics about the, the first run, about the Jack the Ripper story. Um, what, did we, what did we like? What did we dislike? Uh, I'll start by saying that I thought it was a really cool story. I, I loved it. I like the idea of something that has, you know, a cultural literacy, kind of historical relevance being told uh, through a Batman, um, I think because it's set in the 1800s, it's not relying nearly as heavily on all the gadgets and whatnot that uh, kind of modern, um, especially cinematic Batman storytelling has been focused on. Uh, it was a good reminder that Batman is the world's greatest detective. Where it fell the most flat for me is that even though it focused on the, the, the detecting, if you will, I don't think it did a good job of it. We don't actually see Batman finding clues and arriving to a conclusion, we see Batman arrive at a conclusion and give a very brief monologue in a cemetery, and then the story ends. And so I would have wanted to see more of the kind of detective action than just having it retold to me at the end. One thing I really enjoyed is that it gives us a new origin story for Batman, a different origin story for Batman. It follows the very basic premise of his origin story, but it changes it in a way where it is new and it is fresh. Um, his parents still die. The way they die is different, and then what he does afterwards is different. You know, he directly takes over the business, 
and then takes time off to learn, and then goes around Europe being a detective, and then comes back to America to solve the final crime. Like, so ra that's... rather than going somewhere to visit some Taoist monks and learn about martial arts, he goes to Europe and learns how to be a detective, which is... Yes. Uh, and, and the fact that it brings up Sigmund Freud, which I thought was really a, kind of an interesting twist. And like, this is the guy that, that uh, Batman studied under and, and whatnot. I thought that was interesting. I have a thought as you said that, so I'm going to derail the discussion for just a little bit. This came out in 1989, as did Tim Burton's telling of Batman, which has very heavy steampunk influences on the mm -hmm. design, the set design yeah. uh, of Gotham City. And as a similar way in that the person who murders Batman's parents ends up being the primary villain of the story. How much do you think that those two things, these two stories are related to each other? Did one inspire the other? I don't know enough about the interaction between the author and illustrator and the screenwriter and director. So I, I, I've heard that it was pretty minimal in the past, that Tim Burton was not necessarily a big comic books fan, but he read The Killing Joke and went, I can do this. That's what I've heard, but I'm, I would not call myself an expert or anything like yeah, the, that. The Joker's origin story in the Tim Burton Batman, or it's not really an origin story, but it's very similar to what happens to the Red Hood uh, character in The Killing Joke to become the Joker, which is one of the only, or actually the only Joker origin story that's adopted as canon, which is extremely controversial because it's kind of one of the, the hallmarks of the Joker as a character is that he doesn't have yeah, it's so chaotic that you don't know what's truth or not. It's like Heath Ledger's Joker, how did he get these scars? You never know which one's true. Um, and that's something I've always liked about the Joker is, does he even know the truth? Right. Does he even know why he's the Joker anymore? Exactly. And I think it's interesting that um, you know these have a lot of the same elements, uh, that being Gotham by Guy Slide versus Tim Burton's Batman. He's pretty outspoken about not having read a lot of comic books, so I think... Also, if the movie came out in 89, it was in development for years before that. So the comic definitely didn't inspire the movie. Um, you wonder how much the movie inspired the comic, I, though. Yeah, Yeah, and I, I think you can see some of the same elements, but without any other information, I don't think it's... I, I think I'm going to give the author and illustrator of the comic a little more ground and just say that, no, this was their idea and they came up with it. Yeah. I'm going to come from a... I read too much, and I'm just going to say it's a Pat story that's been done a lot. Okay. So I think it might just be a coincidence. I would push back a little bit on your assertion that the twist is enough to make it interesting on the origin story. I still read that origin story and went, uh, <laughs> I don't need this again. So for me, it was just it was a little bit different. Um, parts, some of the parts I really liked were again the detective element. But that's and I guess I, I admitted when we started this that I was approaching this as someone who's not as familiar, who only has a glancing cursory knowledge of comic books. But one of the things that's always kind of pushed me away, and I think this does a good example of it, is like there's all these elements that could be interesting, but then it's over in like 50 pages. And for me, I'm like. Yeah, I, should, I need detective here. I need like the theme developed a little bit more than like a panel. And then it just always, it keeps me at arm's distance. And I think this novel did that for me as well. It kept me at arm's distance because I could see the potential for it to be a little bit better than it was. Yeah, and that, I mean, that is a common crit uh, critique of comic books themselves is that they have to sell and they have to sell monthly. So unlike a novel that only needs to sell once and then sells forevermore as that novel, a comic book has to be, has to drag an audience in every month. And so the stories are a different structure. Um, if if uh, we have seen though with like contracts where it's like you're contracted to make this story and you just have to do two years worth, we do see those comics be a little bit different because they know they have time to develop the story. They don't have to necessarily have every month be the same. They can have a low month and a high month because it's an ongoing story. But yeah, you do see that with comics where it's like every month there has to be something in the story that draws someone in and you only have a limited amount of time to tell a story anyway and so you end up with some interesting structure. That's one of the shortfalls of comic book storytelling uh, is that a lot of these non-mainstream stories are some of the most creative and some of the most well-loved by fans but sometimes they're very risky and studios won't greenlight you to write more than five parts in a limited run series and so you just don't get the development of the story like you could otherwise. It's bad you haven't said anything in a while. Well, I was going to go as I'm not really a big fan of Batman. Boo. Hiss. Respect. <laughs> but I never got really into it. 
but I loved it because it was just, a, I saw it as a fun read. It was completely different. I uh, really enjoyed it. The one hiccup I don't like about this is the fact that he finds his parents killers. Um, in my opinion, that takes away from the drive that is Batman. You take that drive away, and it's kind of like, why be Batman? No. Rebuttal. See that? I, when it becomes, you just become like the Lego Batman. Uh, parents, darkness, like when he's screaming that. And like by <laughs> actually resolving it, I thought that it, it, this could be interesting. And without spoiling too much of the second half discussion, while I thought the first half was a more enjoyable read, I thought the second half actually had more story potential for the future. And that it was a way to address different themes using the Batman idea. And like, especially of like inequality and things like that. And so for me, having that motivation change was a cool twist to it because you get to see what really draws Bruce Wayne back into the life of Batman, which is more interesting than I'll never have the unsinkable hole in my heart filled. Darkness! Yeah, Parents! I, I agree with, with both of you, I think. I, which, uh, I think the point you raised... The, the, the point that Sebastian raised about um, it takes away a little bit of his motivation. I think they sort of addressed that, right? There's like a four-year gap between the two parts of the story. Maybe it's not that long, but there's a gap. Right, and he uh, he was four or five years in Europe, and I didn't think it was that long of a gap between part one and part two. And maybe it's not, but it, but in any case, at the beginning of part two, he's addressed. He's talking with Alfred about whether or not he should continue as Batman, right? Because he's cleaned up the city and he's found his parents' killer, right? And so, what is his motivation to keep going? Uh, he ends up finding some motivation. I'm ready to start on the discussion of the second half. Russ, if you want to kick us off. Um. Second half was not as dry, it wasn't as driven, and so I, I kind of lost some of the love angle interest, kind of bored me, but at the same time using it to explore like zoning conflicts and stuff, I saw the potential for this to be a much more interesting Batman, especially freed from the expectations of kind of what he has to do as Batman, and I feel like when you talk about like fan expectations and things like that, that's another thing that pushes me away from the comic books, is I'm... As my opinion has always been, you've got to do what's best for your story. Who cares about the continuity of this larger thing? And so for me, th this is a really cool opportunity to break free of that, use some of the character, but actually modify it. And so I liked the second half just because of the potential, even if the story itself was boring. And I think that's why a lot of my favorite comics are not part of a visual continuity. It's because it gives the creators a lot more leeway to create and tell a different type of story, kind of like what you were saying, to address different themes and whatnot. Um, I thought the second flat, the second half fell flat compared to the first. Um, I just didn't really care. Um, I think they tried to introduce a lot of characters and different things about Gotham City that, that maybe weren't well enough developed for me to be invested in what was going on. I agree that the love angle was not really that that motivating, but I see what you're saying as far as the potential to tell a different type of story. Um, well, and that's why the vignette thing is so interesting because you say it's a limitation. I think vignettes could make this cooler because you can have each part be like a different exploration of Gotham mm -hmm. and Gotham become its own character. So that structure we're talking about as a limitation, I think also has a lot of potential, especially for this type of graphic art. I, I almost said graphic novel, but almost like a comic book because then you build like through, because that's a fun type of story time. Like, I don't know if you watch television, but there's a show in Atlanta that just came back yesterday. That show is really good. And part of the reason it's good is because it tells vignettes and focuses on moments rather than a traditional structure. It skips a lot of the steps of the traditional structure. This could do the same thing and I feel like be a more interesting. So I'm reading and it doesn't become overtly clear how many years later it is. It's just sometime later, it looks okay. like, so. Okay. Um, I think, this is going to be really, really weird, but my favorite part of the second installment, second part, is um, Bruce Wayne sees everything crumbling down, and he kind of hits like the, uh, the old crap button, he's like, what do I do, what do I do, what do I do, and Alfred just, out of nowhere, is just like, you're a suit, and he's like, oh, good old Alfred, and that was kind of like um, in the video games or in the movies, when Batman needs that extra gear, he... Uh, calls Alfred and Alfred just shoots it over in his little bat rocket or whatever. I thought that was that 
That got to me. It was have cute. You, have you read All Star Batman, the most recent run? No. You should. He doesn't like, read feel, Batman. I feel like Alfred. <laughs> I'll let you borrow the issue where Alfred is a sniper. <laughs> I mean, Alfred was supposed to be SAS, wasn't he? Uh, it depends on where you draw from in the story, but yeah, I think it does. So if you don't know, Alfred was supposed to be British Special Forces before he became their butler. And I say SAS because they're like the most badass of the Brits that everyone knows. And I think at one point they actually say he was SAS. Um, and so he's supposed to have that calm, you know, calm demeanor, that cool under pressure, and also the combat training to help. So I don't know if that's part of official continuity. I'm going to piss Ross off here. Um, I definitely don't think it's part of official continuity in the most recent. The uh, He's supposed to have operative training whether what it is i don't think has ever been official well the continuity is we said not that long ago we're only on issue 30 something of, of batman I'm, I'm blanking on what the new runs are called i don't know man there's like 15,000 yeah. batmans going on at once although but yes at some point in batman storytelling alfred is SAS. i and know I, at one point Bat, uh, alfred is batman so is there a continuity where the batman that's the most important question. <laughs> Bad nipples have been eradicated. They are gone. Um, I, I do, I, uh, sorry, I was reading, but I do want to go back to a point that you made earlier that I agree with. And I really do enjoy one off stories in comic books because a lot of times it takes away the fear. You know, I've seen characters die, I've seen characters fall in love, I've seen, try to, you know, catastrophic events that you assume then have lasting effects. Versus actual mainline continuity of like Metropolis is destroyed and rebuilt in one week, and it's just like what? And the Joker dies, but he's not dead. And you know, like in one-offs, no, Catwoman died. She's dead. There's no more Catwoman <laughs> and things like that. And it's just like oh, well now there's actual stakes. It's a comic book with stakes. <laughs> I'm pretty sure it's been a little bit since I've read it, but I'm pretty sure the most recent All Star Batman run starts out with Gotham City being destroyed permanently. And there's like a road trip scene where Batman is hijacking semi trucks and driving down the highway, and like everybody blames him for what's happening. And so they're trying to, yeah, it's it's crazy. You should read it, but that's not the point. The point is, dropping my gaslight. Um, I don't know. Any other thoughts on the second half? Artwork. What did you guys think about the artwork? Oh, great. Um, I think the art style fit story. Yeah. But yeah. my personal desire for Art styles in comic books is for a lot more detail, so I didn't care for it. Yeah, no, it, it definitely. I think the artwork was thematic with the story, and I think it fit well. Um, if you like stories like that and you like that artwork, you're really going to appreciate it. I really liked it. If you don't, then you're probably going to enjoy it. Um, I don't think anyone's going to find it distracting or not appealing. But if you like that theme, you like that story, the artwork fits perfectly. Sure, it could be better. Artwork could always be better, but it could be so much worse. I'm not going to complain. Like I enjoyed it. I thought it added to the story rather than detract because it helps put you in that frame of mind for that theme. The, um, the second villain, is he just a new villain that we just see and gone, or is he supposed to be as, someone like Jack the Ripper supposed to be the Joker? As far as I understand... Jack the Ripper supposed to be Jack the Ripper. Yeah. Right, but it, it, it kind of hinted that it was... Supposed to be kind of like the Joker. Well, when I've seen storylines, I thought that was just an Easter egg. Yeah, yeah. when I've seen storylines that go back in the past, and they want to include a character that is a reference to a character, they typically make it pretty overt. So this was, um, and so I think go. these are new characters. Yeah, I agree, and I think obviously Jack the Ripper is somebody that we know from from storytelling previously. I did not recognize the, the character in the second half as being anything that we'd seen before. A master? Is that what it is? Except maybe a reference to the Hindenburg at the end, but also like a... I, I, I feel like shady the real stretch. estate has always yeah. been there. Yeah. yeah, I think it's just a new <laughs> character. I, and you know, that's again something that I like about one on You can invent a brand new character and... and no one's going to be mad. Yeah. 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 I might be surprising you on this, but I'm actually familiar with the guy that the artist Mike... Is it Magnolia? Yes. Because he did Hellboy and some other things. Yeah. And um, I actually got his um, Baltimore series on extreme clearance at a book fair oh, for which middle you, schoolers. Did he do uh, Plague Ships as well? Yes. Oh, and I, have, I really I have enjoyed that. it. I liked it much better than this. So really? you talk about the art style and 
I don't. That probably has a much worse reception than this. But I actually kind of okay. I'm sorry. Which did you like better, the actual story or the artwork? Because this story is so much better than than Baltimore and Plague Ships. Both. But but I don't remember Baltimore and Plague Ships stories. The art sticks out to me. Okay. Sounds like we have a future episode in our hands. If you don't mind, let me borrow it and read it. No. And I have it too. I have it in hardback actually. You probably have more of it. I didn't get to finish. I only have. The hardback Baltimore, the plague ships. Okay. There's actually a, it's, I think it's a three parter. So there's Baltimore, the plague ships, and I think there's supposed to be something else, and I don't have we it. We could also Daniel Boone it, and they have a huge graphic yeah. novel collection. They do. Uh, any other thoughts before we wrap up? I mean, I, I, I could, if I wanted to, wait to pull on more on Zach, I could bring up how Gotham is New York City, and how Bruce Wayne's trip clarifies that for everyone. But we will leave that for maybe a different podcast. We will leave that for a different podcast. Gotham is New York City. Metropolis is Chicago. Gotham is Chicago. No! Metropolis is Chicago. Gotham is New York. I don't know. The animated film, is it's definitely Chicago. There's even a World's Fair. Mm-hmm. They're clearly... They're uh, clever, I, the World's Fair also happened in New York City. It also yeah, happened but, in St. I mean, Louis. There's also, so there's also a famous book about Zach, the murder. Zach, sign us off. Yeah, yeah. okay. <laughs> For this argument, okay. <laughs> Listeners, you have a homework assignment. Let us know in the comments what Batman story you'd like us to talk about next. Uh, and remember to suspend disbelief or you'll end up like us.